Hello, my name is, is Michel Trudeau. I work at Oracle, and I work in the language and tooling area of the Java Platform Group. I'd like to talk today about what we've been doing in the several, well, in the last few releases about uh, regarding language features and uh, tooling features. Um, so the overview here, we're going to talk about three language enhancements we've been introducing in the last uh, releases, uh, some tooling enhancements, and a quick note on the deprecated and removed features. Starting with the language enhancements, uh, three features, local variable type inference introduced in uh, JDK 10, switch expressions and rostering literals introduced as preview features in JDK 12. Um, starting with local variable type inference, this is JEP 286. Uh, if you're not familiar with what a JEP is, it's essentially a JDK enhancement proposal and it's a documentation of the feature, the public documentation. It describes uh, the feature, including specs, including plans, and everything. Um, you could find all of these GEPs on the link there, OpenJDK, on the OpenJDK page. And uh, you even have GEP number one, which describes what is a GEP. I can, so. Let's move on to local variable type inference. So it's to enhance the Java language to extend type inference to declarations of local variables with initializers. There are some other cases where uh, var can be used, but this is the main case. The goal here is to improve developers' experience by reducing some source code ceremony with, associated with the declarations. Uh, as an example, you have a, a simple example where I initialize list with a constructor call to array list of string. Instead of mentioning the full type name on the left-hand side, I could use var. Uh, and it will infer the type coming from the right-hand side of the assignment expression. Initializing a local variable with a method call, the type inferred will be the type of the method itself. And here in that case, it's gonna be stream of string. And as I mentioned, um, we also allow var into another context, which is formal parameter declaration for implicitly typed lambda expression. And one of the main use case to introduce this at that location, because your lambda parameters could be typed or not, and when you wanted to leverage inference, you don't put a type there, but if you want to use annotations, you must use a var, because you cannot use an annotations without a type. So to repeat, var is, how should I say, restricted to local variables with initializers, indexes of enhanced for loop, locals declared in a traditional for loop, and formal parameter declaration of lambda expressions. Um, in addition to the normal documentation for VAR itself, we've actually also provided a style guideline where to use VAR, where not to use VAR, et cetera, and a FAQ. These are available at these links. Uh, in order to, in, to talk a little bit about VAR, I'm going to pick and choose some of the guidelines from those guides where it is a very good usage to use VAR to the not so good usage to the not recommended at all. So the first section here, the first guideline is to choose a variable name that is meaningful. Uh, it's always a good practice to use good variable names, but with var it's even more obvious as we're going to see here. Um, let's say I've got this first uh, section of code here. The first line de uh, defines the local variable x, which doesn't mean much. And it's essentially the result of executing a query on a database connection. And it's a list of customer. In that case, I could pick a much better name, such as customer list, and use var in that case. That's a good use case for var. Uh, the customer list really describe what it is, especially in a large method when you have x, y, z, a1, a2, a3, you know, at some point you lose the meaning of these variables. So a, a meaningful variable name like this really helps. Uh, another case in a try-catch statement where I use result as my query for my local variable, and it's better than X, but it's still not great. Customers is much better. At least I know it's a set of customers. It's, it's a stream of customer in that case. So var is a good uh, place to use, uh, to use it there as well. Um, sometimes uh, considering var when the initializer provide sufficient information to the reader is a good uh, use case as well. We often initialize local variable with constructors and or factory method calls. 
In the first case here, I initialize output stream with a constructor, and I repeat the type on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Uh, therefore, var is a very good case here. Don't need to repeat that information. Same thing when I initialize from a factory method call, such as reader or list. Here, the list case is interesting because I initialize this with a set of one or more string literals, so I know my list is gonna be a list of string. Uh, if I initialize this with a set of variables where I don't know exactly the, the, the type of these variables from a reading perspective, then maybe var is not as recommended there, but for this kind of use case, it's a very good use case. Um, The number three guidelines, not to worry too much about programming to the interface. Uh, it's a common idiom in Java programming to construct an instance of a concrete type and assign it to the abstract type. Uh, as an example here, I'm constructing an array list and I'm assigning this to a list. But sometimes in a complex hierarchy, I don't really know what is the right abstract type I should assign this to. Using var simplifies this case quite a bit. Um, now, where I need to take a little bit more care when, when and when not, when not to use var. With primitives, for example, there are some primitives that's pretty obvious. The var case, it's at all not ambiguous, such as a Boolean initializing with true or false. It can only be a Boolean. Uh, same thing with a character literal and the same thing with a string literal. It's all unambiguous. But come some cases where it's a little bit more ambiguous. Using var for bytes, shorts, or long may not be exactly what you want because the actual type of flags, mask, and base will end up being int in that case. And with null, it's not allowed at all. You cannot say var object equal null because first we cannot really determine what type the user really wants here. Here, in this case, the type that the user seemed to want is list of city, but there's no way from that information of the left-hand side uh, statement that we could, we could figure this out. Therefore, the compiler gives you an error. Another case where var, uh, you have to be a little careful, is when using var with diamond or generic methods. So, both var and diamond are features that allows you to omit some explicit type information where it can be derived from the information already pre present in the statement. And you can even use both of them at the same, in, in, together, but it's really not recommended as we're gonna see here. So the first case, I'm using a diamond on the first statement and I'm using var on the second statement. It's pretty clear what item Q type is gonna be. That's uh, the compiler can figure it out and the user, it will be pretty clear by reading this. But comes a case where if I'm using var with a diamond, uh, there's no way the type is gonna be what the user really expect. So the type of that statement will end up, for item Q, will end up being priority Q of object, not priority Q of item, like it was originally intended. So therefore, not recommended here. Another case where var could be very useful, uh, for the sake of this slide, because I don't have a lot of, lot of room in slides, uh, my complex stream call chain is only three operations, filter, map to int, and max. But as we've seen with streams, the call chains could be very, very long. You could have streams of 10, 20 lines long. And sometimes they're so long that they're getting hard to read, and they're getting especially hard, hard to debug. So splitting those streams is kind of, is kind of, uh, is kind of a good idea at some point. And um, var makes it really cheap to simplify this because you don't have to figure out what is the intermediate type. You could let the compiler figure out the intermediate type. In that example, I have a set of blocks and I wanna get all the blue blocks and from those blue blocks, I want to uh, figure out what, which one has the max weight. So first what I could do is initialize my set of, uh, get my set of blue blocks and initialize this to the local variable blue, blue blocks using var. I don't need to worry about the type exactly. It's all, the compiler is gonna figure this out. And then I could use these blue blocks to f figure out what is the max weight. So in complex stream operations, we believe it makes the code easier to read if you could split them. And also it makes the code easier to debug as well, where it's much easier to put a breakpoint here. Um, 
Having said that, we're moving on to the other two language features. But before talking about the two lang new language features, as we have moved since JDK 9 on the six months release cycle, these major JDK releases are coming really fast. And therefore, introducing new language and VM features, we decided that it was a good idea that sometimes not every of these features must be final right away. So we decided to introduce preview language and VM features. This is all described in JEP 12. And the essence here is a preview language or a VM feature is a new feature of the Java SE platform that is fully specified and fully implemented, but yet it's not permanent. Meaning if there's, enough, if there's uh, considerable or if there's significant feedback, uh, we may make some adjustments before we finally release the feature. And somehow, if we really get it wrong, somehow the feature may never really appear it's gonna get re re removed, but um, that's in the extreme case. Uh, so in order to use these preview features, we've, had, we've added a new command line argument, enable preview, dash dash, enable dash preview. This allows you on the command line of the Java compiler, the Java launcher, and the other tools to allow you to leverage uh, these, uh, these preview features. And the reason why I'm talking about that is because the next two language features we've introduced in JDK 12, which we are currently working on, which we are shipping in March of 2019, are two preview features. In normal circumstances, if you're using IntelliJ, NetBeans, or uh, Eclipse, you don't have to worry too much about these flags because the IDs uh, will provide support for these flags. So the first one I'd like to talk about is uh, switch expression, JEP325. Introduced in 12 as a preview feature, it extends the switch statement so that it can be used as either a statement or an expression. And that both forms can use either a traditional or simplified scoping and control flow behavior. These changes will simplify everyday coding, as you're going to see. Uh, the goal here is to fix some ir several irregularities of the existing switch statement, including the default control flow behavior, fall through with breaks, everything of switch blocks, the default scoping of introducing temporary variables, and the fact that switch is available currently only as a statement. So the switch statement was originally modeled closely on C and C++ and supported the concept of fall through semantics. Uh, so if you forgot a break, it was falling through in the next case, et cetera. Um, it was very powerful. It is still very powerful. We're not changing that behavior. It's powerful to write low, low level codes such as parsers, but most of the switch written out there nowadays are more in a high level context and break is only additional verbosity that people have to deal with. Uh, so some of the advantages of what we're trying to fix here is providing exhaustive coverage of case statements, improving the scoping rules so that you don't require temporary variables as much, no fall through on the right-hand side of the case statement, and providing only the choice of an expression, a block statement, or a throw expression on the right-hand side of a case label. Uh, so introducing what the new switch expression case label looks like, the switch label. So essentially it's the case, uh, the keyword case followed by one or more labels, followed by an arrow, followed by, as I mentioned, an expression, a block statement, or a throw statement. So on the lower left side here, I've got an example of a traditional switch uh, statement. So essentially what it does here, day is an enumeration with the seven days of the week, and then it's gonna print the length of each day uh, in terms of character, um, how many characters in the day itself. Um, I'm gonna reuse this, uh, this example in, in, in the next few slides. Uh, on the other side, on the right-hand side, it's the new form of the switch. As I said, there's a few things to note here. So on the first and the third case, I can use more than one label separated a comma separated list. I'm using an arrow here, and on the right-hand side, an expression, a block statement, or a throw statement. This is an expression here that I'm, that I'm using. And as you can notice, there's no more breaks. So there's no fall through. There's no way to fall through with, with this new system. So scoping of locals. I mentioned that one of the advantages we're trying to fix the scoping of locals here uh, 
So essentially, since you can only have, with the new switch uh, rules, since you can only have uh, an expression or a block statement on the right-hand side, therefore you cannot introduce local variables that expands to the entire switch. In the traditional switch that I have as an example down here, under case Monday, I'm introducing a temporary, an int temp, and unfortunately, the scope of the temp doesn't end at the break. It ends at the end of the switch. Therefore, it's available for all the rest of the switch. And reusing that temp or forcing people to uh, rename to a different variable name when they want to reuse a name that's very, very similar within the same branches all led to errors and it was error prone essentially. So we're trying to fix this. We're fixing this with the block statement. Uh, so as well, a switch statement is often just essentially a simulation of a switch expression. Each arm either assigns to a common target variable or returns a value. In that case, it assigns to a target, uh, to a common target variable. So moving to what a switch expression looks like, expressing it as a switch it's cleaner and it's also safer. So here I have an example of a switch expression using the new form of case label as well. So as you could see, uh, to the right-hand side of the assignment, I have, a, I have a switch, which is an expression. And essentially what it does, since on the right-hand side of each arrows, it, I'm only allowed to have an expression or a block or a throw statement, Essentially, that's going to be the return value of the switch itself, and it's going to assign it to the int num letters. Um, so the switch expression, it raises additional requirements since, since every case arm must compute a value or a compatible type. Um, a switch expression is a poly expression. If the target type is known, in that case, num letters is an int, the target type is known, this type is pushed down into each arm. The type of the switch expression is its target type. If it's not known, if we're using var, we're gonna compute by combining the type of each case arm. And if we cannot figure out a compatible type, we're gonna raise an error. Uh, so here the types are used. If, if I'm using a string literal, for example, in any of these case arm, the compiler will generate an error because it's not going to be compatible with an integer. Since on the right-hand side I can have an expression or a block, well, therefore, if I have a block, how do I return a value? And that's where we've extended the break statement to allow a value on the break statement in order to allow to return a value. Um, as you could see here, I've removed the last case, case Wednesday, and I replaced this by default in order to demonstrate how to return a value using break length here. So the break is the one terminating immediately the switch expression and returning a value. For switch expression themselves, we also allow the use of traditional case labels. So this is a traditional case label switch, but it's an expression, it's not a switch statement. And in order to return from every case, you use the break with the value. So you could take a look at the break and it looks a little bit like a return in a method where return can return a value with a value in the case of a non-void method or no values at, at all in the case of a, of a void method. It's, it's very similar and both break in that case and a return immediately terminates the execution of, of uh, the switch expression here. As I mentioned, one of the advantages here is total coverage of cases. So the case of a switch expression must be exhaustive. Every case must return a value. For any possible value, there must be a matching switch label. Else it's an error. In that case, I'm switching on an int, and obviously I'm covering only two ints here. So obviously this is an error. This is an error. There's a default case missing here. The, the compiler will flag this as an error. Same thing if I'm using an enumeration, it's possible with an enumeration to cover all the cases. If I uh, enumerate all the, 
value of the enumeration. But in that case, I'm only enumerating two out of seven. So therefore, this is as well an error. There's a, there's a, there's some cases missing, or there's a, there's a default statement missing here. And every, um, every case statement must yield a value in the case of an expression. So for example, here in my case Monday, on the right-hand side, I'm using a block instead of an expression, but the block doesn't yield any value. There's no return here. There's no break value here. So therefore, that's an error. The compiler catches this. Same thing in a traditional case statement with the expression switch. Uh, every case arm must return a value. Here, the default doesn't return a value. Same thing. So that's for our switch expression feature. Next is our rostering literal feature. Uh, so this is JEP 326, again introduced as a preview feature. And a rostering literal can span multiple lines of source code and does not interpret any escape sequences. So the goal here is to make it um, easier for developer to express a sequence of characters in a readable form, free of any Java indicators, to or, and or to supply a string targeted for grammars other than Java, so very convenient to insert snippets of source uh, inside your Java source file, whether the source is Java or any other languages, as we're going to see, and to supply a string that can spawn several lines, several lines without having to supply special new line integrators. It is not a goal of that feature to introduce any string operators. And it's no longer, a, it's not as well a goal currently of that feature to directly support string interpolation. So definition, uh, so important here based, uh, for the feature. A rostering literal consists of one or more character enclosed in sequence of backticks. A rostering literal will open with a sequence of one or more backticks and will close when an equal number of backticks is encountered. Any other sequence of backticks is treated as part of the string body. So here's what I mean here. Uh, my first string literal has an embedded double backtick in it. So I'm surrounding that raw string literal with a single backtick. As my second example, my string literal contains a single backtick. I need to use two backticks to as the delimiter. Here, if my string happens to contain one or two back, one and two backticks, I need to surround it with three backticks on multiline. Uh, it's always the guideline is to use the least amount of backtick and the guideline is also to use an IDE because the IDE will do this for you, <laughs> will manage the number of backticks, will figure it out inside the line, oh, do I have some, any kind of sequence of, of backticks and insert the right number of backticks. So. Um, in my definition, I said that the string literal consists of one or more characters. The one or more was important because Two backticks in a row does not define an empty string literal. There's no way to define an empty, empty raw string literal. To define an empty string literal, you must use the traditional double quotes. So a raw string literal is an alternate form of the, of the standard traditional uh, double quoted string literal. It can be used anywhere a double quote string literal was used in the past. I'm giving all the examples here such as passing this as an argument to a method, inside a concatenation expression, as an initializer, calling methods directly on it. Is the, there's, no, there's no difference in that respect. Here, a rostering literal help code clarity in many situations, including regular expression patterns, Windows file paths, and multi-line messages. I'm starting to, with the regular expression pattern here. In a traditional string, we had to escape every single special regular expression uh, character. Um, and that was a little error prone because sometimes you, you forget a backslash, you forget to escape things uh, 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 properly. So the rostering literal makes it a lot easier and cleaner. Very similar for the Windows file path where in your application, you must make sure you never forget a, to escape a backslash. Well, rostering literals allows you to not, to not worry about this anymore. Same thing for the double quote inside a, win, a Windows path. So I could, as you could see, it's a lot easier to read your Windows path and it's less error prone. And for multi-line, it's very similar. Like for example, I'm inserting a chunk of HTML here. 
where there's a lot of verbosity on the left side. On the right-hand side, you don't need to specify backslash in as line separators. There's no concatenation happening. There's, you don't, it's one backtick. You can have as many lines as you want, then you close it. So easier to read. In order to manage uh, rostering literal, we've introduced a few new methods on the string class. Uh, a line in order to clean up some spaces around the, bod the body of the source we're inserting, indent to help indentation, and some other methods. Uh, in, there will be more about tabbing and about escaping, but right now this is the set of methods that we feel are needed uh, to introduce as part of that feature. So looking at an example of uh, some of these methods inside real code. So essentially here, um, I got a name and address and a phone, and my rostering literal has a name, address, and phone formatting issues. And essentially, align, I'm gonna use the align method here. On my rostering literal, right after my rostering literal, you see the dot L align, it's calling the align method on the rostering literal. The align method, what it does, it's removing all the vertical and the horizontal white spaces margins from around the essential body of the multi-line string. So essentially here, it will remove all the, all the leading new lines. There are two leading new lines here. It will remove all the space left uh, to name, address, and phone, but while preserving relative indentation. So when you look at, at, the, at the result, it prints from the beginning of the margin, and it keeps the, uh, address being indented by one space. So it, it preserves relative indentation. There are many more examples, but uh, giving tight on time uh, this is what an important feature I wanted to show. Um, next, moving on to some tooling enhancements we've done. I'm gonna talk about two areas here. So one feature we've introduced is launching a single source file uh, single file source code program, and I'm gonna mention fairly quickly some of the Javadoc improvements we've done in the last few releases as well. So JIP 3.30, introduced in JDK 11. We shipped JDK 11 last month at the end of September. So this is to enhance the Java launcher to run a program supplied as a single source, single file of Java source code, including usages from within a script by means of shebang, shebang files and or related techniques uh, on Windows. So the motivation here is to uh, people helping learning Java, writing small utility, uh, writing scripts, running from source directly without having to worry to compile the code first and managing where is my class file and my class path and et cetera. Here's a simple example here, how to use the Java source launcher with that feature, Java space L world Java. That's it, that's all I need to do. As long as my application is in one source file. So some of the aspect of this, uh, your source file can have any extension at once. You can name it .txt and can have no extension at all. And the no extension use case is very useful because your application looks like a executable. It looks like a binary uh, uh, when you're gonna run it on the command line. I'm getting there soon. Um, it can, the Java source launcher can be used to test preview features as shown in the second uh, section. Internally, this Java source launcher works at the very, very high level. It works as if you just call the Java compiler, compile to the bytecode in memory, and then launch your bytecode from memory. Uh, there's no intermediate source file, nothing at all. And all the arguments specified after your source file are passed to your application directly. So to introduce a little bit about shebang files here. Uh, so this is available only on Unix derived systems like Mac OS or like uh, Linux. And it allows the operating system to execute a source file. But if for, in order for the operating system to be able to execute a source file, it needs a little bit of information. And the information it needs, it needs some, it needs for the first line of the source file to be of a very specific format. So it must start with hashtag, followed by exclamation mark, followed by the location of the binary to read and run your source file. 
And in the case of Java, we also need to specify the release version of the source you're gonna run. So how does that work? I've got my little example here, Hello World, uh, which is only six lines of code. And then I, I'm going to be able to, on that file particularly, I'm going to be able to uh, flip the executable bit, make that file executable, and I can run it on the command line directly. And the operating system knows what, what to do with this. On Windows, that might work as well if you use SIGWIN. If you don't use SIGWIN, there are other facilities such as the SSOC command line program and file type command line program, which provides very similar functionality. Um, next, some Javadoc improvements here. So in uh, JDK 9, we've introduced a search feature in Javadoc. The search box is at the upper right corner. If you've never used it, you should give it a try. It's, uh, people love that feature. Uh, in JDK 10, we turned on HTML5 by default for our own documentation. You could still use HTML4 in your own documentation by, by using the right set of flags. We continuously add new improvements to better support modules, Jigsaw from JDK 9 throughout 9, 10, and 11. We made some improvement on broken links. There was many broken links in the past in our own documentation, and it was, uh, we provide better facility now to identify broken links in your own documentation as well. We cleaned up the navigation bar since we moved the Java doc from a frame-based UI to a no frame-based UI, so there's no need for next and prev and frames and no frames anymore. We continuously improve accessibility. This has been a requirement as well. And we've introduced a new Docklet API so you could build on top of our a Java doc system. So we provide a new API and, new, and a new Im implementation. The old API is still there if you're using it. And we, at some point, we will deprecate it and we will remove this API, but we have currently no plans to do so. So a note, a quick note on deprecated and removed features. Um, so, in JDK 10, we removed Java H. Uh, it wasn't a big deal because the workaround is pretty easy. There's a dash H command line arguments on Java C that does the same thing. So it was not very controversial here. On JDK 11, we deprecated the Nash or JavaScript engine and we deprecated Pack 200. Well, definitely that was a little more controversial, but please note that we have deprecated these features. That doesn't mean we have removed these features. These features are still available. You could still use them. It just means that they're no longer actively developed on. We're still fixing bugs in them. We're still fixing security bugs in them, but they're no longer actively developed. Uh, we have no current plans to remove these features on and uh, before we're gonna remove these features, we will have to create a removal JEP and we will have to socialize that JEP with the community and it's gonna be a community process to remove these features. But currently there are no plan to do so. So everything I talked about, I'm talked about existing uh, uh, features and releases, but I've also talked about features in a new release. JDK 12 is a new release that will be available in March 2019. And uh, we are, publicly promote weekly builds for that release. And the weekly build are available at that link up there. Uh, on that page, you will find the release notes for this, for this release and the API Java doc, and you will find 64-bit binaries for Linux, Macs, and Windows. Uh, you could download that build, start, you, start using it. You could use IDE. Some IDEs are already supporting features from JDK 12. Uh, some of them are already supporting some of these features in their production bill and some and only in their early access bills. And in order to stay informed about what's going on, uh, the features that we're working on, the features that are currently being, being uh, developed and int just general interest about what's going on in the, in the JDK, I invite you to subscribe to uh, the right mailing list. We have several mailing lists to, to subscribe to. Every project that we're working on in the JDK have a mailing list associated with it. Uh, 
In our particular sphere, sphere of language and tooling project, we have three major, major projects we're working on. Project Amber, which you might have heard of. This is a project about introducing, uh, exploring and introducing smallish productivity-oriented Java language features. All the language features that I talked about are introduced in the context of that project. Project Panama, which is in interconnecting JVM and the native code. Uh, see Project Panama's foreign API talk on Thursday, 11 a.m. in that room by Mauricio Simadamore. And we're also involved in Project Valhalla, which explores the introduction of value types and generic specialization for the Java platform. Having said that, this is my talk. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. We have five minutes for questions, but everything is clear.